So we are in this series called The Lost Parables. And it's called The Lost Parables because in Luke chapter 15, there are three parables that are all put side by side. And each one of these parables has something that has been lost. The first parable we saw last week is the lost sheep. <clears throat> this week is the lost coin. And next week is the lost son. So these three parables were purposefully set side by side. And they explain each other. They emphasize each other. They're like three verses to the same psalm. So this week we are looking at the lost coin. So let's read that passage first today. And then we'll go through and unpack the beauty of this amazing parable that we have this morning. So our passage this morning is going to be Luke chapter 15, picking up in verse 8. Where suppose a woman has ten silver coins and loses one. Doesn't she light a lamp and sweep the house and search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost coin. In the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. So our passage this morning was short and sweet, three verses. And the imagery of this parable is lost money, cash, silver coins. And this is a parable where the lost coins represent lost people. And the woman looking for the coins refers to what God is doing. And last week we talked about what it means to be lost and consequently what it means to be found. But recognize the imagery of the silver coins, the significance. This parable reveals that we are valuable. We are valuable in the eyes of God. But whenever someone says we're valuable, right? That sounds good until we start driving home and then we start thinking to ourselves, just how valuable are we, right? What does that mean exactly? Am I a dime or a hundred dollar bill? What kind of value are we talking about here? And that's a reasonable question to be asking of a parable like this one. Because after all, the imagery it's using is money, currency. So we should ask, how valuable exactly are these lost silver coins? So that's where we'll start this morning. Value. So let's kick off this idea of value with an illustration that will hopefully help capture some of the emphasis that we're seeing. So I want you to imagine with me. Imagine that I lost some money, and it's somewhere here in the church. And the first person who finds it will get to keep it. Now you might be wondering to yourself, right? How much money are we talking about here? And if I told you uh, it was just a single coin, one lost coin, you might go, uh, darn, right? Our hopes begin to sink, but wait. What if it is this lost coin? A one ounce gold American eagle, right? And this single coin is worth eh, approximately, changes every day, but approximately $1,300. Whoa, now we're getting interested, right? How many of us would jump out of our chair, jump out of our seat, and we're ready to start flipping over the pews, right? We are ready to look for this lost coin. In fact, we probably won't stop looking until we find it, until someone finds it. This is a valuable coin. But I want you to imagine our reaction and how it would change. If I told you I lost some money in the church somewhere, the first person to find it gets to keep it. But here's a picture of what I lost. A $2 bill right? It fell out of my pocket somewhere. Are you still going to jump out of your chair? Are you ready to start flipping over the pews, looking for it, searching every corner and room? I mean, this is a $2 bill. This is cold, hard cash. You could go to IGA and buy a candy bar. If you're particularly thrifty, it might even be a king size, right? I want you to take away from this illustration 
one core point, a key takeaway. The value of the object that was lost determined how hard we searched for it. The value of the object that was lost determined how hard we would search for it. When it was the gold coin, I could see it in everyone's eyes. They were excited, right? They were thinking, oh my goodness, please let there be a lost gold coin in the church that I can find. I'm ready to tear this place apart. But when you saw the $2 bill on the screen, the fire in our eyes dwindled. It wasn't quite the same. Eh, not quite worth me getting out of my chair. $2? I'm not really about to go searching for just $2. Tearing the part of place for that? My kids might think that's fun. They might help you. I'm going to stay right here. The value of the object that was lost determined how hard we would search for it. Now take that idea and look at the woman in the parable. She is searching intently for this lost coin. In fact, the searching aspect of this parable is heavily emphasized. Even more than last week, what we saw with the shepherd, right? The words to the shepherd's story went like this. He goes after the lost sheep until he finds it. But the woman, she lights a lamp. She sweeps the house and searches carefully until she finds it. There is an escalation in the searching from last week. So this must be some coin, right? Because essentially the woman jumped out of her chair, grabbed a flashlight, and started flipping over the chairs looking for that lost coin, ready to tear the place apart. Doesn't care if it takes all day. And in our mind right now, maybe what we're picturing for this lost coin is that golden coin, right? This really valuable coin. And here's something pretty cool about this passage. We actually know the exact value of the lost coin that the woman is looking for. Because our English translations, they just say coin or lost coin. But in the original language, it uses the proper name for the coin that was lost. It'd be like us saying dime, quarter, nickel, one ounce American gold eagle, right? In the original language, it uses the name of the coin, a drachma. And a drachma is a Greek minted silver coin. And we have these coins in museums. If you're the right person with the right connections, you can actually pick them up and look at them, evaluate them, feel how heavy they are. And what I've done is I went in and looked up one of these coins from this time period, and I looked at how much silver there was in this coin, how much it weighed in the silver that was in there, and then I converted that amount of silver into our modern currency. How much silver costs today? Okay, maybe this wasn't the cool part yet, but are you ready to hear how much this coin would be worth in our modern dollars? $2.07. How many of us probably have that much cash in our seat cushions of our couches, right? If you do, get the little V baby bottles, right? <laughs> $2.07. And there's part of us that reads this passage and almost thinks in our mind, seriously? All that searching for that? Are you sure there isn't a calculation error, Michael? Well, possibly. If you look at some of the other commentators on this passage and what they're saying about this drachma, one of them in particular says that this drachma is only worth 18 cents. However, if you look at the actual coin, it has yeah, about four grams of silver, so it seems more reasonable that it's two dollars and seven cents. Not a crazy number. What does seem crazy is the reaction of the woman now, right? It's just a two dollar bill. Why is she searching so intensely? Well, from the context, there's something we learn about this woman. She's probably quite poor. There's two clues that we see from the context. One of them is that she lights a lamp. 
And she would need to light a lamp because in the poor income housing, usually there wasn't a window. If there was a window, it was real small. It's dark in there. She needs a lamp to search the little house that she's living in. The other context clue that the text tells us is that she only has 10 drachma. Her bank account only has about $20 in it, right? This is a poor woman. And she's flipping over chairs, grabbing her flashlight, because this small drachma, it's a tenth of what she owns. This is her wealth, her treasure. <clears throat> and this may be just $2.07 to us, but this is irreplaceable to her. And now we're about to really see what is the captivating beauty of this passage. Because over and over in this world, our value will be assessed. And our value is often assessed by maybe bosses giving us performance reviews, or teachers assigning grades, maybe friends giving criticism. In this world, our value will often be determined by a set of two factors, our abilities and our possessions. And it makes sense, right? If, if someone was to ask you, how much is so-and-so worth? What's their value? Well, you might ask yourself, well, how much money do they have? And what kinds of skills do they have? And at some point, this value system gets buried into our head. Then we get this idea that we can't quite shake. And this idea says that I need to be a golden coin before I'm really worth something. I need to be a golden coin before God would ever want me. But look at what just happened in this parable. God said he tears apart the house to find all $2.07 of you. You don't have to be the golden coin because in this parable, God is willing to be the poor woman. You're no longer just $2.07 because he looks at us through the eyes of this poor woman and sees a tenth of his entire fortune. God looks at us with a different measuring stick our value is no longer simply determined by our possessions or abilities. It's determined by the abilities and possessions that God would spend to find us. For that $2.07, God would jump out of his chair, grab a flashlight, and start flipping over the chairs. Not stop looking until he has found us. So here's our second takeaway when it comes to this idea of value. People the world may declare insignificant, God declares a treasure. People the world may declare insignificant, God declares a treasure. And this idea actually fits perfectly with the context of this passage. Remember last week we read those first couple verses of chapter 15, and Jesus gives us these parables in the context of two groups of people, right? And one of these groups is the sinners and tax collectors, or as we dubbed them last week, the drug dealers and IRS agents. And on the other side are the people with possessions, skills, the valuable people, the scribes and Pharisees. And the religious people, the valuable people, are, are giving Jesus criticism criticizing his value system, saying, you're welcoming the $2 people, sharing meals with them. And we return to that point. Those the world may declare insignificant, God declares a treasure. And there's actually another element to this parable, and it's what happens when the widow finds her lost treasure. She celebrates. She rejoices. She actually commands in there, rejoice. So after she lights the lamp and sweeps through the house, searching carefully for the coin, verse 9 says, And when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, 
I have found my lost coin. In the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Those words, rejoice with me. I have found my lost coin. Those words are really, really important. And the reason why they're really, really important, two reallys, is because those are the exact same words that are stated in the first parable, right? They've been repeated a second time. Those are really, really important words, and they're acting to set the stage, prepare the, the world to see the next parable. Because in the next parable, we face the question, well, what if I don't really feel like rejoicing? What if uh, it doesn't seem really, really important to me? The woman calls to us, commands, actually, in this passage, rejoice with me. I have found my lost coin. It's actually pretty wild because in verse 10, it tells us that the angels are rejoicing. They are partying in heaven. There is quite the celebration going on, right? And if we were to picture what all this looks like, it would look something like this. Imagine a city-wide party going on all through Columbus over me finding a lost coin. We can even maybe imagine some of the people who would walk down the street and see this party occurring and think to themselves, you all are nuts, right? All this for two dollars? But those are the people who are looking at the lost coin through the eyes of the world. And then we see those who are rejoicing. And those are the ones who are looking at the lost coin through the eyes of the poor woman. Let me give you an example, an illustration of this idea of rejoicing that will hopefully help land this final concept for us. It has to do with weddings. And it would be bizarre for maybe one of us to drive hours and hours, maybe across four different states, to go to some random person's wedding. Maybe someone we've never met before. We don't know them. They're not a relation to us, right? Why would we ever do that? It would be weird. All that energy to go to a wedding for someone we have no idea who they are. Now imagine the exact same wedding, down to the details, right? Same venue, same cake, same colors, same songs, same vows. Except this time, the person being married is a close relation to us. Maybe it's a brother or a sister. Well, now we would go halfway around the world for that wedding. Same celebration. Reflect on that. These are basically the same event, except one we would never go to, and the other one we would go out of our way to attend. And the key difference between those two weddings is this. How valuable to us is the person getting married? How valuable is that person getting married? That question determines whether we're rejoicing or whether we're staying at home, staying in our chair. Here's the same idea worded in maybe another way. And it has to do with this idea of rejoicing. When people are not important, the party is not important. When the people are not important, the party's not important, right? And this last point is almost a little bit ominous because there will be those who do not see the party as important because they don't see the people as important. All this for $2? They're asking why we're celebrating, sharing meals with those people. But remember, God is saying, rejoice. My lost treasure has been found. Wow. So how do we begin to adjust our perspective? How do we begin to see through the eyes of the poor woman? 
Well, that is the question that actually leads us to our application for this week ahead of us. And this application for the week ahead of us can be summarized in one phrase. It's this, recognize the value God sees in us. Recognize the value God sees in us. And us means personally, ourselves, but also us as in the people around us as well. And I'm going to ask two questions that will help flush out what this application means in our lives. Here's the first question. Do you recognize the value God sees in you? We don't have to wait until we're that perfect golden coin before God will want us. Because God would celebrate to have us. This week, there will probably be those people in our lives who are assessing our value with the eyes of the world. Bosses, teachers, peers. And here's the application. No matter what they say or think, be ready this week to remind yourself of your true value. The value that God sees us with, no matter what others say. And the world's value system is fickle. Possessions can be stolen. Abilities can be lost. Our value, if the world says we're that golden coin, at best, it's temporary. Be ready this week to remind yourself that it's not just $2.07. Because God says, I'm the poor woman, and you're like the coin. That's a tenth of everything I own irreplaceable, my treasure. Do you recognize the value God sees in you? Be ready to remind yourself this week of that value. Here's the second question that guides us in the application. Do we recognize the value that God sees in others, the other people around us? And when we see the value that God sees in others, This is what it'll be like. Here's a picture for you. It'll be like when we walk up to a garage sale. And as we're walking up to that garage sale, we recognize a long lost, original Rembrandt painting. Whoa, right? And that Rembrandt painting, it happens to be in a box that says 25 cents. And us maybe feeling a little bit convicted, this is not right, right? We'll, we'll run up to the owner and, and start to tell them, explain to them, you have a priceless Rembrandt painting here. And they'll probably respond to us, Rebrandt who? Uh, fine, fine, 20 cents. I need to get it out of my garage, right? I want to do something useful. I want to put my Bowflex in there, right? Just take it. A Rembrandt in a box that says 25 cents. That's it. That, that's crazy, right? But doesn't that world do the exact same thing to people? We see the sinners, the drug dealers and IRS agents shoved in a box that says $2 or best offer. Are you recognizing what a long-lost Rembrandt looks like? These are God's treasures. Remember our first takeaway from this morning. The value of the object that was lost determined how hard we would search for it. How hard would God search for us? Well, one of the most popular verses in the Bible, John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. God searches for us like the poor woman searches for the coin. Now, is there someone in your life that you've maybe treated, maybe put inside that $2 box? Eh, 
They're not really quite worth me getting out of my chair. $2? Uh, I don't know if that's worth searching for. Tearing apart the place. Just $2? Think of the name of that person, maybe. <coughs> Reflect on it. Is there someone like that in our life? And ask ourselves, do we now see the value of and fill in the name of that person? Do we now recognize that God values and what he sees in others? Our application this week is to recognize the value God sees in us. Us as in us personally and us as in the people around us. And as we draw this second message of this series to a close, here's a little bit of an overview, quick summary of what we've learned so far in this series. These verses go together. And last week was the shepherd and the lost sheep. We recognize that we need to not stop loving lost sheep. And this week, we recognized that we don't just need the heart of the shepherd we need the eyes of the poor widow who looks and doesn't see an insignificant coin, but an absolute treasure, a treasure that's worth searching for, a treasure that's worth celebrating. As we follow Jesus, let us strive to have his heart to love others and his eyes to see others. Let's pray together. Father, we just, we know, I know, I've put people in that box that says 25 cents before. Would you help us to see those people, whatever that name was, with your eyes fresh this week? Let us see the value of your lost treasure. That person, that name, it's a lost, long lost Rembrandt. We just forgot what it looks like. Father, be working in our hearts this week. Give us that passion. Give us that heart. Let us have the love that you love others with and the eyes that you see others with in our lives this week, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.